very long time. Centuries passed by. And that's why, as we were going through the tafsir of the story and the explanation of the story, when we were speaking about how Allah preserved their sleep, how when they woke up, they were still afraid, how their body had been preserved, how their mind had been preserved, how even the emotions had been preserved. When you put it into the context of how many years it is, you see the greatness of this miracle and this sign from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 300 years, three centuries passed. In our time, it is very rare for a person to even live for a single century. Many people die at the age of 60, 70, 80. In fact, our Prophet told us, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, أعمار أمتي بين ستين وسبعين that the average age of my ummah will be between 60 and 70 years. It's rare that you find people in their 80s, let alone 90s, let alone over 100. But they slept for 300 years alone. But Allah Azza wa Jal, in the way that He frames this time and the way that He mentions the years that passed in their sleep, He mentions it in a very distinct way. He doesn't say 309 years as we would normally or rather, he says 300 years and an additional nine. And the scholars of Tafsir, rahimahullah ta'ala, mention that this is an eloquence of the Arabic language mentioning it in this way. But what is its significance, the eloquence of saying it this way? This is where they differ. Some of them said that Allah Azza wa Jal mentions it in this way to distinguish and make a distinction between the solar years and the lunar years. There is a difference of approximately 10 to 11 days between the lunar calendar and the solar calendar every year. So the 300 years would be solar years. The 300 years with an addition of 9, meaning 309 years, would be the lunar years. So Allah Azza wa Jal mentions both because throughout the story, one of the reasons why this is done and Allah knows best, is that throughout the story Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking about how He is using the heavens and the earth the universe and creation to preserve the sleep of these people. So now Allah Azza wa Jal to show His control once again of the heavens and the earth gives both years, the lunar calendar and the solar calendar. And this is a common opinion that you find in the books of Tafsir. Other scholars from the scholars of Tafsir such as our Shaykh, Shaykh Ibn Al-Thaymeen, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, they said that there was no such significance in this regard. It isn't solar and lunar years. It is just a form of Arabic eloquence. Either way, the main part of this story or the main lesson from this verse is not whether it is solar or lunar, whether it is this type of eloquence or that type of eloquence, but rather it is the length of time that Allah Azza wa Jal decreed that these people would go to sleep. Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala says then in the next verse, قُلِ اللَّهُ أَعْلَمُ بِمَا لَبِثُوا Say Allah knows best how long they slept. لَهُ غَيْبُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ to him belongs the knowledge of the unseen in the heavens and the earth. Abusir bihi wa asmi'. How Allah is all perfect and all clear in His seeing and in His hearing. Ma lahum min dunihi min waliyin wa la yushriku fi hukmihi ahada. There is no one who is a partner besides Allah. They have no helper besides Allah Azza wa Jal, and there is no one who is a partner in His dominion, in His rule. So Allah Azza wa Jal therefore concludes the story of the people of the cave with this powerful statement of how Allah Azza wa Jal controls the heavens and the earth. He has knowledge of the heavens and the earth. He has complete and perfect knowledge and hearing and seeing and names and attributes subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is no one who can be with him in any of this regard. No one who is his partner. No one who has any part within this dominion and kingdom of Allah Azza wa Jal. It belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. What is the significance of this story in relationship to the Dajjal? The Prophet told us sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that the Dajjal is something which if you read and understand and memorize the surah, you will be protected from his trials. But why? What is the significance? Now that we have covered the first story and understood the first trial, I want to go and speak about the trial of the Dajjal in more detail so we can see how all of this fits together and the wisdom behind connecting all of these different pieces together with regards to the Surah Al-Kahf. The Jal is the greatest trial. As the Prophet told us Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there has not been a trial that has come from the time of Adam until the end of time that will be greater than the trial of the Dajjal. He also told us Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in another hadith that there was never a single prophet except that he warned his people against the Dajjal lest the Dajjal should come out during that time. 
So it was a great trial that all of the people, all of the prophets had always warned their people concerning. But now we know that the Dajjal will come towards the end of time. He will appear in the Ummah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet told us Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam concerning the circumstances in which he would appear. He told us that from the signs of the appearance of the Dajjal is that people will forget about him. And the Imams will not mention him from the minbar. So when the people become ignorant of the Dajjal and his reality and his trials, that is the time when he will come in. That is the time when he will appear. When the people no longer are able to connect to Surah Al-Kahf, understand the trials, understand why this Surah is connected to the Dajjal, that is the time when he will begin or start to appear. The Prophet told us وسلم, that the time in which he will appear will be drought and famine. And even though there is some difference of opinion over the authenticity of this hadith and Allah knows best, he said in this narration that three years before the Dajjal appears, one third of the rain will stop and one third of the produce of the earth will stop. And then two years before he appears, two thirds of the rain will stop and two thirds of the vegetation will cease. And then a year before the Dajjal appears, not a single drop of rain will descend, not a single plant, not a single piece of vegetation will grow. And that is when the Dajjal will come. He will come at a time of drought and famine. He will come at a time of poverty. He will come when the people are in need of food and sustenance and resource. The Dajjal will come and the Prophet told us Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that the Dajjal will come and his call will be that I am Allah. I am your Lord and God so worship me. He won't come and say I am a prophet or I have some revelation or I am calling to some other religion or I have a different philosophy or idea. He will come and say I am God. There is no God beside me. You must worship me. So the Prophet ﷺ described him to us vividly. He told us that he was a man who will have a broad stature. He will be tall and he will be broad in his shoulders. He will have a thick neck to the extent that it will seem that his head is fixed upon his neck. He will have curly hair locks. And the Prophet ﷺ described them as being like the heads of devils. He will be one-eyed, his right eye will be like the pulp of a grape, he will be blind from it. And the Prophet told us Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, know that your Lord is not one-eyed, but the Dajjal is one-eyed. He will not be able to see from his right eye. His left eye will have a thin film or layer of skin over it so that he won't be able to see clearly from the left eye. Upon his forehead will be three letters that every single Muslim will be able to read, whether they are literate or illiterate. He will say kafara, disbeliever. He will come and he will be a big man. Some narrations say that he may even have a slight hunchback to him. He will have a broad stature. And the Dajjal will be someone who will neither marry, but he will be human, nor will he have children. Inshallah, we're going to take a short break here. And then after the break, we will continue with the description of what is mentioned concerning the Dajjal in the sunnah of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So please stay with us. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Marriage or divorce? What's Islamic ruling? Nikah. Solution or problem? Heaven or hell? Uh, there is a misconception. You choose. Beauty. Wealth. Family status, virtue. Decide what you want. Decide your choice. Be sad or be happy. It's your choice. Join Dr. Zakir Naik in Better Half or Bitter Half every Friday at 6.30 p.m. and repeat telecast at 9.30 a.m. Eastern Time on Peace TV. A friendly message by Dr. Zakir. Win over your enemy. In this age of hatred and animosity, our all-loving creator has prescribed the formula for winning over your enemy. In the glorious Quran, in Surah Fusilat, chapter 41, verse number 34. Nor can goodness and evil be equal. Repel evil with what is better. You will see that he 
with whom you had enmity will become your close friend. Do not defeat your enemies, but rather win them over. Win their hearts and win their minds. Beats TV, the solution for humanity. Let's come under the shade of the scholars. So the issue is a problem of knowledge. Asim Al-Hakim. Why do people do bid'ah? Imam Malik said, whoever claims there is a good innovation in the deen. Salim Al-Amri. He is accusing that Prophet Muhammad did not convey the message. Dr. Mamduh Muhammad. If you know that the Prophet ﷺ did something and I do something else, you have to follow the Prophet ﷺ. Don't follow me. Abdul Rahim Makati. But if each one believes his goal is to please Allah, to follow the Sunnah of Rasulullah. Abdul Rahim Green. I think this really is to do with your internal state. Where does the Quran and Sunnah point to? Muhammad al Sharif. We have to follow what Allah and His Messenger said. Let's imbibe from these scholars the fruitful solutions for the problems of the world. Which one we would take and which one we would leave? Question to every Muslim. To every Muslim. In the shade of the scholars. Next on Peace TV. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. Welcome back. Before the break, we were speaking about the Dajjal and more specifically the description that was given to us about the Dajjal from the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ described him to us in such vivid detail and told us about him so that we would be able to seek protection against him. We would be able to know how to ward off his evil. The Prophet told us ﷺ that he will come in a time of extreme drought and famine. And that when he arrives, it will be a time when the people are in need, they are in poverty. His call will be that he is God and that he should be worshipped alone. The Prophet told us وسلم, that when he will go to a group of people, he will come across a village and he will say to them, Worship me, I am your God. And those people will refuse and they will say, No, we don't worship you. You are not our God. So he will leave them. He won't do anything, he will leave. And as he leaves, all of the rations that they had stored, the little amount of food that they had kept so that they could have a little bit each day, it will be destroyed. And then the Dajjal will go across another village, come across another town, and he will say to them, believe in me, I am your Lord. And they will believe in him. So he will point towards the sky and he will say, bring forth your rain and it will begin to rain in that area. And he will point to the ground and he will say, Bring forth your vegetation, your produce, and the vegetation will come forth and they will have food. In other places, he will tell people to believe in him and they will believe. So he will point to the ground and he will say, Akhriji kunuzuki. He will command the earth, bring forth your treasures, and the gold and silver and gems of the earth will come forth to them. The Prophet told us وسلم, in some narrations, again, these narrations, its authenticity is different over, but some narrations say, that he will have a mountain of bread and meat with him. So those people who believe, it will be a temptation for the people that they believe in him. And if they believe, he will say to them, take from this whatever and as much as you want. He will have with him also two rivers, as the Prophet told us, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, a river of fire, molten lava, and a river of water. And the Prophet told us, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that no, in reality, his river of fire is cool water. And his river of water is fire. If a person doesn't believe in him, some of them he will kill. And others he will say, I will kill you. Here are two rivers. Fall into whichever one you want. You will drown. Choose which one you want. Those people of strong iman, the Prophet ﷺ said, if ever you have to choose between them, choose the one of molten lava of fire. For indeed, in reality, it is cool water. But look at the strength of iman that a person would have to have and the certainty that they would have to have about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his hadith and what Allah says in the Quran for them to willingly throw themselves into a river of what appears to be molten lava and fire. The Dajjal will go across the earth. He will stay for 40 days. As the Prophet told us Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the first day will be like the length of a year. The second day, the length of a month. The third day, the length of a week. 
and every other day will be like the normal days of a year. Forty days he will stay. He will roam upon the earth, as the Prophet ﷺ described, like wind-driven rain, meaning fast. He will go across the earth and he will conquer the earth. There will only be a few people from the believers, from the mu'mineen, who will disagree and disbelieve in him and stay away. The Prophet ﷺ warned us about his trials, that a person will go seeking him out, thinking that they are strong in Iman, but when they see the different temptations that he has, they will apostate and they will become his follower. So the Prophet ﷺ said, don't seek him out. The Prophet ﷺ said a time will come when a person will tie up their family members to the pillars of the house out of fear that they will go and seek the Dajjal. Such are his temptations and his trials, and that's why he is the greatest of trials to come from the beginning of time until the end of time. The Dajjal will go to every land, he will conquer every land, his followers will grow. As soon as he appears the first time, 70,000 people will immediately follow him and form part of his army. He will enter every land except for Mecca and Medina. The Prophet ﷺ told us that at that time Mecca and Medina will be surrounded by gates. And at every gate there will be two angels that will have swords that are brandished, ready to defend those cities. So when the Dajjal comes to Medina, he won't be able to enter. So he will become angry and he will strike the earth with his fists three times. And with each one there will be a small earthquake with which every single hypocrite and disbeliever that may have been in Medina will be exiled. Some narrations say that he will go on top of one of the mountains close by to Medina and he will look down upon Medina and he will see the white masjid, the masjid of Nabawi, masjid of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and he will say, this is the white palace of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. The Dajjal will stay around that area in Medina and the Prophet ﷺ told us of a young man who will appear from Medina, a believer, strong in Iman. He will be one of the exceptions to the rule. He will seek out the Dajjal. He will come across the army soldiers of the Dajjal and he will say, take me to the Dajjal. They will say to him, do you believe in him? And he will say, no. So they will say, so then why should we take you? We should kill you. But then one of them will remember that the Dajjal said, don't kill anyone until you bring them to me. So they will bring them to the Dajjal. This man, the believer from Medina, the young man, he will say, you are the Dajjal that our Prophet warned us about Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Dajjal will kill him, cut him in half, and he will fall into two pieces. And the Dajjal will walk between him and he will walk back. And then he will say to the man, Qum, stand, and the man will stand once again. The Dajjal will say to him, now do you believe in me? Now do you believe I am God? The man will reply, this man from Medina, and he will say, Mazdattu fika illa basira. Now I definitely know that you are the Dajjal. Now I really know that you are the Dajjal. The Dajjal will become angry. The people around him are waiting and watching. He will cause this man to lie down. He will take his sword and he will try to chop off his neck. But that is when Allah will make his neck turn into brass and copper. So every time the sword of the Dajjal strikes his neck, it bounces off. He cannot kill him. So he will become even more angry. He will lift him and he will throw him into that river of molten lava and fire, which in reality is water. The Prophet ﷺ said concerning this man, This man will be the greatest martyr in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Dajjal will then leave and he will go towards Syria and he will go towards Jerusalem because that is where the final army of the Muslims is encamped under the leadership of the Mahdi of that time. And as the Muslims come out one day preparing to pray Salatul Fajr and the army of the Dajjal is approaching, that is when Allah will send to the earth once again the Prophet Isa alayhi salatu wasalam, who will descend in Damascus. He will then come to Jerusalem and he will arrive at the time of Fajr as the Muslims are about to pray. And the Khalifa, the Mahdi will see him and he will say to Isa alayhi salam, lead us in prayer. Isa alayhi salam will respond, this is an honor for your ummah, you lead us. So the Mahdi will lead after Fajr, the Dajjal and his army will enter into Jerusalem and a great war will take place. But as soon as the Dajjal sees Isa alayhi salam, the Prophet sallam said he will begin to disintegrate. He will lose his strength and his powers, just as when you put salt in water, that is how quickly he will disintegrate and dissolve. When he sees Isa, he will know that he will die. So he will flee the battle and he will run. And Isa alayhi salam will chase him and he will kill him. 
and then the Muslims will be victorious in that battle. This is a brief summary of the story of the Dajjal. Why is this linked to the story of the Surat al-Kahf in general and the story of the people of the cave in particular? Because the trials that Allah mentions in Surat al-Kahf are the same trials that the Dajjal will bring. The Dajjal will bring the same trials as the trials that are mentioned in Surat al-Kahf. If you know, understand, memorize, contemplate Surat al-Kahf, you take its lessons and you know how to overcome those trials in your life, then inshallah, by the permission and mercy of Allah, if the Dajjal ever appears in our time, then you will know how to overcome his trials as well, because they are the same and the solutions are the same. This is what Allah wants from us, that we come closer to Allah. So look at how the Dajjal will persecute people in their religion, just as the people of the cave were persecuted for their religion as well. The people of the cave overcame this by turning to Allah Azza wa Jal. So likewise with the Dajjal, he is a trial that will come. How do you overcome that? By turning to Allah, seeking Allah's help, His divine protection, His mercy. We are coming closer to Allah Azza wa Jal by worshipping Him even more. The companions radiallahu anhum ajma'een understood this concept. When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was mentioning the duration of the Dajjal stay, 40 days on earth, one day the length of a year, one day like a month, one day like a week and so on. The only question that the companions asked was, O Messenger of Allah, how do we pray on those days? Look at the question. Look at the understanding of the companions. Look at the contemplation and their level of knowledge. They didn't say, O Messenger of Allah, how do we fight him? How do we defeat him? What weapons should we build? What tactics should we use? What type of system should we have at that time? No. All they wanted to know because they understood it is a trial of religion. To overcome it, you must attach yourself to Allah. Worship Allah even more. Trust in Allah Azza wa Jal. Be firm in your Iman. They said, O Messenger of Allah, how do we pray on those days? If a day is like a year, a day is like a month, a day is like a week, do we pray just five times? Or do we pray the prayer of a month or a year or a week? So the Prophet ﷺ replied and he said, estimate the timings, meaning that you pray the prayer of a year or of a month or of a week and you estimate the timings because the sun will only rise once and set once, but its length will be a year. So you pray in estimation the prayer of the year. But look at the understanding of the companions. Look at how they really truly understood the message of Surah Al-Kahf and the trials that are contained therein. The Prophet ﷺ is telling us, informing us in these trials of the Dajjal that he will bring the trials that will be in Surah Al-Kahf. And that's why he said, whosoever memorizes the first 10 verses or in a narration reads the first 10 verses or in a different narration reads the last 10 verses of Surah Al-Kahf, Usima min fitnati Dajjal, they will be saved from the trial of the Dajjal. You must understand the principles of this story. You must understand the Jal will come as a trial from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but he is only a trial from Allah azza wa jal. The way that you overcome other trials, that is the way that you overcome the trial of the Dajjal as well. This story of the people of the cave in particular, it deals with the trial of persecution, the trial of religion. And the companions radiallahu anhum ajma'in would benefit from this because they too would have to suffer persecution and oppression for their beliefs and their religion. And they too would take these lessons and they would use them in order to overcome this challenge and this trial by the mercy and the protection and the help of Allah Azza wa Jal. And with that, inshallah ta'ala, we conclude this episode. I hope that you will join me next time. Jazakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.
ایمانس آف پرافٹ محمد پیس بی اپان ہم ابو ہریرا میں اللہ بی پلیزڈ وتھ ہم رپورٹڈ اللہ میسنجر میں پیس بی اپان ہم ایز سے بلیونگ مین شوڈ ناٹ ہیٹ ہز بلیونگ وائف If he dislikes one of her characteristics, he will be pleased with another. Sahih Muslim, Volume 2, Book of Marriage, Hadith Number 3469. for humanity. Perfect with no flaws at all 